Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin. Now, this week we're devoting the entire episode to the Break Nutrition podcast with Raphael and Gabor, which you can find at breaknutrition.com. Richard Morris was a guest on episode 31. We thought it was a great discussion, and apparently so did Raphael and Gabor. So much so that they asked us if we would air it on Two Keto Dudes. Of course we said no way. <laughs> Well, it's a bit long, nearly two hours, but we're going to play the entire thing. And we'll be back next week to our regular dude thing that we do. See you then. Heard you say y'all do for a little. This is the Break Nutrition Show with Raphael Sertoli, where we break down the myths about nutrition and health, helping take you from theory to practice. This podcast is brought to you by HealthIQ.com the fastest growing life insurance agency in the United States. You know how people save money on car insurance by being good drivers? Well, Health IQ saves you money on your life insurance for living a health-conscious lifestyle. What Health IQ does is quiz you on your health habits, such as running, strength training, CrossFit, and eating a paleo diet. This helps them estimate how healthy you're likely to be. If you qualify after taking the quiz, they can then get you lower rates on life insurance, saving you up to 33%. They can offer this because studies have correlated physical activity with a 56% lower risk of heart disease, 20% lower risk of cancer, and a 58% lower risk of diabetes compared to people who are inactive. That's according to a study from 2006 from Warburton et al. To be clear, those are relative risks, not absolute risks. Lastly, you know how some people on a ketogenic or low-carb diet see their LDL cholesterol rise and end up paying more because of it? Well, Health IQ will argue that this is outweighed by the predictable decrease in triglycerides and increase in HDL cholesterol. That I like very much. To see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com slash BDN or mention the promo code BDN when you talk to a Health IQ agent. Hello everyone, I'm Raphael, your host of the Break Nutrition Podcast, and back with me today for episode 31 is my co-host Gabor, as well as Richard Morris of Two Keto Dudes fame. Richard and his friend Carl Franklin uh, host a great podcast, as well as a forum for people to learn about the science of nutrition and help each other out along the way. So please take a look at both the podcast and forum, they're really worth your time. Hi guys, how's it going? Yeah, good night Raphael. Hey. So we have uh, Gabor and uh, Richard here with us. Uh, so this is a real treat for me because uh, I know we have uh, three three nerds on the line here. So we'll have a lot to talk about. Um, so this is the first time I've ever been a guest of a podcast. So that's a new experience for me too. Oh, is it? I, I thought um, you'd been on some other podcasts, but I just might have no. missed them. Yeah, I think oh, I, I think we were on with I was on with Carl on one of Jimmy's ones, but it was just like a, a fleeting moment. But. This is just right. me by myself, so I'm quite nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. I've, I've seen you uh, uh, dive deep into the biochemistry on the Facebook thread, so you have nothing to be nervous about. Uh, okay. In fact, why don't you give us a bit of your background, because people might sure. might confuse you for someone who's had uh, years and years of deep you know, uh, scientific training or research, so maybe give them yeah. a little background. So I actually have half of a pure math degree. Uh, I went Uh to university at one of the sandstone universities in Australia when I left school. And I did that for two years and of a three year degree. And I got into an argument with one of my lecturers because I wanted to go into computers. And and back then, this was in the uh, early eighties, the only way you could get into computer science was to study pure math. And most people who did math became math teachers. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to get into computers and I wanted to, I wanted to focus more on, on, uh, microprocessors and uh, object-oriented programming. And and my lecturer at the time, uh, or the senior lecturer for computer programming uh, in, uh, I shouldn't mention the university because uh, I'm about to tell you, he said to me that I was wasting my time with object-oriented programming languages. I should focus on COBOL. I should focus on mainframes because that's where all the money was. Nobody had any money to spend on writing software for PCs. <laughs> so. Wow. Uh, so that was so I left uni uh, with a half of a degree. Uh, so I have half of a Bachelor of Science. Uh, and the interesting thing is I, 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 I had a successful career. I, I worked on Wall Street for two years building credit risk analytics. I uh, was a chief executive for a software company uh, for four years in Vegas. And 
uh, and I retired early uh, with type 2 diabetes. And um, this was, I was 38 when I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And uh, I basically retired or semi-retired to, to try and work out what the heck was going wrong with my metabolism. Why was I sick and nobody else was appeared to be sick? And uh, it took me about 10 years before I, I worked out that the keto diet was actually helping me to reverse my diabetes. And, and then uh, that sort of got me interested in going back to school again. So I actually signed up this year for the first time to go back to school to do biochemistry. And I'd done oh, a couple great. of, yeah, I'd done a couple of biochem subjects in my computer course because biochem subjects are more credit points than math <laughs> subjects. So, uh, mm. I did some astronomy as well. I did, you know, I, I, I was, had a fairly eclectic education. So that, that's um, interesting. And I've often said that if I could, you know, have a, a do over education wise, I'd, I'd take math and computer science, even if I was <laughs> going into bi- biology or nutrition or whatever really? other subject. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, if you can, you know, if you can sort of use maths and 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 coding, and under have that sort of engineering background mixed into it, I think you're at a great advantage compared to many traditionally trained biologists. Yeah, um, it certainly helped me with uh, trying to work out uh, type two diabetes, at least in my own personal case. Mm-hmm. Taking a systemic yeah. approach to it, and and you'll see this with a lot of engineers. Uh, they they. Uh, they take a more systemic approach and, and try and look, try and work out where root cause comes into the picture and uh, and to try and work their way back from that. Uh, yeah. So that's fairly common. I think Richard Bernstein was an engineer before, and he 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 became a, a physician sort of in, later in life. I think he was in his fifties before he went to medical school. And uh, Ted Naiman was also an engineer, and then uh, uh, went to medical school. And uh, Ivor Cummings, of course, is a chemical engineer. So. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, a lot That's of true. engineers. A lot of engineers are on our side of the thing, the fence, trying to work all this stuff out. Absolutely, and, and Gabor, you have a, a master's of science, uh, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, but that's that's Is in that... molecular biology. So I have uh, formally, I have nothing to do with right. engineers. Just uh, I have been working with engineers for more than uh, ten years now. So maybe they they have. Yeah, a, yeah, so you've got the same. I got some infection me. from engineers. I. <laughs> Yeah, the keto flu. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so you have a, a really uh, awesome podcast, Richard. I, I like Thank the you. mix of uh, uh, you know guests you have on, and sort of you, you tend to end it with uh, you know some some recipes and yeah. and other fun stuff. So that's that's uh, something I really like. And one of the things that we were talking about before recording the podcast is the amount of of uh, propositions you get for advertising exogenous ketones. Yeah. Um, so maybe you want to give people uh, a, a notion of how common that is for you to receive those requests and how you deal with them, how you think about accepting or rejecting them. Yeah. So we, we have a lot of requests for advertising. We, we rarely advertise on the show. Um, that won't always be the case. We will certainly accept uh, advertising for uh, worthwhile um uh, pro- projects and it may well be that exogenous ketones may be a worthwhile project but i don't see them there right now uh we get normally when an exogenous ketone company contacts us the first contact that they make with us is asking us what flavor we we want <laughs> for, <laughs> for, for, you know so uh, to, to misquote bill nye from uh, love actually don't uh, buy exogenous ketones kids become a podcast <laughs> and i'll send them to you for free <laughs> so uh, so you know and, and uh, the, i have a few problems with ex- exogenous ketones the first really is that that um I'm able to make them, <laughs> you know, cheaply and in the right context and of the right chirality and, uh, you know, the, the, um, in, in, in the evolutionary context. Whereas, um, I have a problem with, I have, a, I have multiple problems with the idea of a manufactured ketone. The first is obviously that most of these are racemic. So ketones have uh, uh, stereoisomer. Uh, they are uh, chiral, so they, ha- they can have a stereoisomer. And you can think of it a little bit like if you've ever played Tetris, the L shape you, that comes down. You see a hole in your in your uh, Tetris building that's L shaped, and you see an L item, and you drop it down and just to find that it's the wrong shaped L. It's in the opposite direction. So it's like a mirror image. And so 
most of uh, most of our enzymes work on on structure, not on chemistry. So they work on on uh, the structure of of uh, of the 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 uh, the um, uh, chemical that they're working on, or the molecule that they're working on, and uh, in the case of uh, the enzyme that converts uh, acetoacetate into beta-hydroxybutyrate and back again, it only works on the uh, D isoform. So, right. Uh, so the right-handed on, one. That's right. And the uh, and the left-handed one, the L isoform. Uh, well, the D isoform, we've got roughly three billion years worth of evolutionary experience. Our germ plas- our germline has three billion years of experience being able to make it and use it and developing the context for it, using it as a signaling molecule. So, so we have uh, that. So, in the right evolutionary context, um, it's perfectly natural and normal. The problem is that uh, we've only got you know maybe twenty or thirty years of experience in using the other, you know, the left-handed form of, of uh, beta hydroxybutyrate. And uh, I, there have been tracer studies that have have. have Basically, radio tagged the carbons in a in a L beta hydroxybutyrate molecule, or in about three micrograms of which, and then given given it to a mouse, and it exhales some of the uh, CO two. So we know that so, somehow that beta hydroxybutyrate, that left handed beta hydroxybutyrate, has made it into respiration, and, and and it's been breathed out. But nobody really knows the pathways that it took mm-hmm. to get there. And nobody knows, for, and if we don't know the pathways, we don't know uh, what transports it's using potentially. We don't know what uh, what other processes that may be critical that are becoming rate limited because of this. Uh, you know, so there's lots of big question marks about uh, this left-handed beta hydroxybutyrate, and we're playing with a, a very critical uh, component. The energy, the energy mechanism of the cell is is a very critical. Um, Area of the of the of the of a human body to to, to be messing around in. So um, that's right. I guess that that's my first concern. Um, and uh, I, I guess um, so. There are a lot of un, uh, known unknowns. I think that's a fair way of of, of summarizing the issues you brought up. Um, yeah, I, I yeah. think well. So there, there's a good example of a chiral molecule uh, that where the D isoform treated morning sickness. And the L isoform caused children to be born without limbs. It's called, it was called thalidomide. And right. so my concern is that this ketogenic diet has proved to be very beneficial for diabetics, helping them to, to reverse their diabetes. But if we have a thalidomide uh, event in, uh, in this, uh, in, in, associated with ketones, then potentially the ketogenic diet would be reputationally harmed. And, uh, and so that's, that's, I guess yeah. that's my first concern. Um, so I'd like to know, I'd like to see some science explaining the pathways uh, by which L-beta-hydroxybutyrate is metabolized and, uh, and to know that they're, that they're as, as benign as we can, can discover. So that's mm-hmm. the first thing. The, the other yeah. thing is that, that, um, uh, that the, uh, the ratio of, the t- of two of our ketones, acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate, is in, in an equilibrium that's determined by our redox state. We actually use the ratio of those two in circulation to determine uh, the NAD plus to NADH uh, uh, state uh, ratio in, 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 in a human body. Uh, so my concern is if we're introducing endogenously produced beta-hydroxybutyrate, will that put the thumb on the scale favouring more NADH and less NAD plus? And then that's going to have an, a, a follow-on effect uh, um, uh, of a, on a load of enzymatic reactions, um, such as DNA repair, um, uh, response to, rea- uh, to ROSs, and, and so, right. you know, so that so so that's that's another concern uh, because um, the uh, the the enzyme that converts ac- that cro- converts acetoacetate to beta hydroxybutyrate and back again um, uh, uses NAD NAD plus on one side and NADH plus a, a H molecule a hydrogen molecule on the other side and so um, that uh, that particular um, uh, by eating beta hydroxybutyrate we're sort of putting our finger on the on the scale and we're basically saying okay we're going to have <laughs> we're going to have more NADH uh, in the system, and uh, and that's going to have a f- flow-on effect. So, um, and, and I guess the, the the final thing really is is that we don't really know. We we know that it hasn't really killed a mouse yet, 
and we know it hasn't killed anybody who's eaten it yet, but we don't really know what a caloric dose of exogenous ketones do to a human over a good percent of their lifespan. So I'd have no problem giving... If I had an elderly relative who who had um, Alzheimer's or um, Parkinson's, I'd have no trouble giving them um, exogenous ketones because their potential... Uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, you have to weigh up the pros and cons of not treating them. Yeah, uh, with, and, yeah. and their, their, their potential um, lifespan is a lot less. But would you give it to a 30-year-old, a fit 30-year-old? You know, that's another question. And and so, uh, and then, of course, the, the, the fact that uh, some of these ketones are produced by um, by labs that used to produce anabolic steroids, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a very scary uh, area to play in. So I, I'm willing to be convinced, uh, and I think that we can do the science to convince, you know, to, 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 um, uh, uh, convince us, but, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, at this stage, I think there's more questions than answers. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a, a very fair overview. Um, so before I play devil's advocate, because <laughs> that's, that's yeah, what we like to do here. Um, I, I would like to, to know if Gabor has anything to add, comment, or, or what his views are on the appropriateness or lack thereof of using those, uh, yeah, yeah. those exogenous. You keychains. better not ask me about any kind of supplements, I, I think, because, uh, I'm kind of an anti supplement guy. Uh, I mean, whenever it's not uh, necessary, just don't do it. That, that's my, uh, stance on, on, mm-hmm. on this. And, um, regarding, uh, yeah, just a short story, uh, from earlier this morning, I, uh, Despite my views, I supplement my wife uh, with uh, potassium uh, citrate. You know, she's mm-hmm. uh, she has a chronic kidney disease of uh, non-diabetic uh, origin, and for this reason, uh, we try to reduce the acidity. And uh, mm-hmm. she's been uh, using some uh, sodium bicarbonate uh, in the evenings, sure. but uh, after meals, uh, we came up with this idea to add a little bit of. Uh, potassium citrate and just this this morning i tried a little bit in my uh, drinking water after breakfast and now i feel uh, dizzy and and uh, actually i have a slight uh, headache so i would say all these supplements are out of uh, context so maybe i'm the i'm the second uh, guy uh, i mean I, i'm the I'm second only after Bill Lagakos uh, using the word uh, context mm-hmm. because in, I think in yeah. biology it's, it's extremely important and it's, it's true if you have a look at uh, biochemistry, so the sort of basics and up to evolutionary context, uh, context is extremely important and uh, most uh, supplementation, I believe at least, is uh, completely out of uh, out of context. So if you add something uh, which um, Normally, in, in the right natural context, uh, is uh, uh, it comes with uh, with uh, many other compounds. So, in, in some kind of a balance, and then you throw in just one thing, and uh, it's 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 completely out of balance. Actually, I tend to believe that we don't know what we are doing when we we uh, we supplement almost anything. Actually, the the only supplement I use is uh, vitamin D uh, D three uh, mm-hmm. during winter time. That's it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I get sun in winter time. Even in winter time, I'll take my shirt off and go, you know, get some sun yeah, and some cold thermogenesis. Uh, it, it, this attitude, uh, latitude, it's, it's imp- impossible. So uh, mm. right now we have minus uh, two and yeah. some snow. So I, I get out into the cold, but that's for another reason and not, not mm-hmm. to get, uh, not to produce vitamin D. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, oh, so I, I was about to say only, but I guess that's relative. Um, I take, 300 milligrams of magnesium, 300, uh, 300 milligrams of potassium, and about, I think it's about 20, 21, 22 milligrams of zinc. Mm. Uh, the reasons I've done that is because I've had a lot of chronic inflammation growing up due to allergies and asthma, and which tend to sort of use up those, those, especially magnesium, because the, the sure. bronchioles uh, have a very high use of magnesium. And the zinc, because I, I've had a, a, a sort of um, strong allergy to them, one of those severe allergies where you can go into anaphylactic shock if, you, if I eat crustaceans, right. um, which tend to contain a very high amount of zinc. Um, 
so that I've sort of taken a, a sort of anticipatory approach thinking what's the worst that can come of it. But to be perfectly fair, if I stop supplementing, I don't feel a, a, a subjective difference. And I've, I, I'm very happy to stop for a while and try again. So I think, um, uh, you know, your, your, both of the points that you raised still stand. Um, yeah. I think that's, that's fair to say. Um, I, I, I don't, yeah, go ahead, Richard. I, I was just going to say, I think the, the issue of context is important when it comes to beta hydroxybutyrate in that it, it's not only a substrate, but it's also a signaling molecule. Mm-hmm. And, and we're not, uh, evolutionarily, we're not, uh, we're not used to having both glucose and insulin and beta hydroxybutyrate high at the one time. So, to Gabriel's yeah. point, uh, that's um, uh, that's a context that we're not used to. So, very unnatural. Yeah, absolutely. And so, I'll I'll bring up the the post that uh, I wrote uh, a few months back on Break Nutrition about this um, about beta hydroxybutyrate and what I call the evil twin. Um, mm. the, this mm-hmm. idea that, you know, it might not be as safe as, as we might think or might hope for. And this sort of argument became more, uh, discussed more popularly on, in, in our, uh, online, uh, communities when Dr. Veach appeared on the Ben Greenfield podcast. Yes. And Dr. Veach is one of the sort of OG researchers in this area, really, yeah. you know, sort of producing, uh, ketones in, in the lab. And what, so he is, he's quite, uh, worried about, uh, getting the right isoform in the, in the hands of people. Uh, he's, he's likened this to a sort of, uh, uh, potentially dangerous underestimate of, of how we measure it in the blood and how we extrapolate those measurements, which might be falsified given that, uh, the precision extra meter, which is FDA approved, might not recognize the different isoforms floating around in the blood. It can't um, really because it, uh, the, yeah. no, the way that it works is that the, the I have the precision extra right here. It's, it's mm-hmm. uh, and, and the way that it works is that it it has uh, beta hydroxybutyrate dehydrogenase uh, in the in the strip, and so it it and and it will convert that to acetoacetate, and mm-hmm. it counts the counts the hydrogen coming off. So so it can't it can't register left handed beta hydroxybutyrate. And, and so this is, so, so I, I bring this up and, and you're, and you're right to, to specify that because when people have taken, uh, ketone esters, their blood levels do go, can go up very quickly. Mm. So my question is, what is happening there? Is there a very quick conversion? Is the ketone ester given in the, uh, right-handed isoform? So, and depending on who you buy it from, that might change. We know that some come in the form of, uh, what is it? One, one, three butane diol that will become D beta hydroxybutyrate. Um, then you have some which come, you know, in, in, in salts or or esters. So Mm -hmm. they can be attached to, you know, sodium, calcium or potassium. So we've got a lot of variability. And when we talk about exogenous ketones, I think it's important to distinguish between which ones are we talking about specifically, because like the, sure. uh, like you mentioned, the meter might recognize it or not. Mm. Um, and another point, uh, I guess that that's worth bringing up is that, uh, Dr. D'Agostino, which is a, a researcher, um, all of us, you know, uh, appreciate for the work he's done with uh, epilepsy Absolutely. and oxygen toxicity and, mm. and, and cancer and, and all of those things. And he's actually quite, uh, he's in strong disagreement with Dr. Veach. Um, he, he's made statements uh, on the Ben Greenfield podcast. So he went on the podcast after uh, Dr. Veach did saying, you know, across the board, essentially those ketone uh, esters or ketone salt that, that he's been producing. So I wouldn't want to, you know, attribute any other uh, uh, supplements uh, in this, in this statement that they're essentially positive. And, he, he explained that 24 to 48 hours after ingesting a racemic mi- mixture of ketone salts, about 80% of what's ingested will turn into the D uh, or right-handed isoform. And, you know, 20% uh, of the, of the left, ha- left-handed beta hydroxybutyrate will get metabolized just like fats, a- according to him. Okay. And, and another point he raises with that is that these ketones have been, these exogenous ketones have been taken since the 1950s which he estimates to millions of doses taken by humans with no evidence of harm. So he remains skeptical that, you know, 
the the racemic ketones can lower oxidative stress and mm. you know m- might uh, protect animals against hypoxia stroke brain injury and but he you know he he sees a role for the for them in those uh, situations and i think the strongest evidence for them is the glycogen storage uh, diseases where right. they've been very helpful for people who who have who have issues you know well, their body has has issues sort of balancing the use of of, of glucose and, and fats like a, a normal body would. So, and these are both researchers that you know I would only I could only hope to be one tenth as good as them, and yet they they're you know debating this on on very different sides of the spectrum. So th- this is still quite an open question to me, and in those instances, I like to apply the precautionary principle. Exactly and, what I was going to say. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and, and you could call that the, an evolutionary framework or precautionary principle. And I think when it comes to sponsorship, uh, we should be, like you said, we're ready to be convinced. But until we are, it, if we refuse sponsorship, it's not out of some naturalistic fallacy. Um, no. we've given specific reasons for why. And so it'll be interesting to see how, how this evolves and, and which esters are good or, or, or bad, essentially. And even in those cases where they're good esters, the application might be very constrained. Right. Um, or, or it might not. Or it might be great for 30-year-old athletes. Who knows? This is very, a lot of science to be done in that area, I think. Yeah. yeah. I, think certainly, I think certainly for, uh, for diabetes, I don't see a use for... Uh, hmm. elevating beta hydroxybutyrate because the whole point of of of, uh, of of a ketogenic diet for diabetes is if you if you are unable to manage your glucose level by you're unable to manage high glucose by uh, producing enough sufficient insulin to be able to lower that then uh, by not eating any glucose you um, you uh, are able to manufacture glucose on demand whenever it goes low. So it's basically a secondary uh, homeostasis for glucose at the low end instead of the high, high end. Uh, it's like a backup that keeps us alive. Uh, producing ketones is just a side effect in that regard. Yeah. I mean, the, the whole point of a ketogenic diet for somebody with type 2 diabetes is to, as a backup uh, homeostasis for their glucose level. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's funny because, you know, we, we talk a lot about applying ketogenic diets for diabetes, but in a sense, it's nearly misleading because like you said, it's more of a side effect. And where I think the ketogenic diet would be less of a side effect and more of a goal might be in conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, which yes. see a, a high activation of, you know, the NLRP3 inflammasome. And we yes. know that beta hydroxybutyrate can directly uh, function as a signaling molecule to sort of inhibit that overactivation. So there you might really want to sort of quote chase ketones as it's been put. Yeah. And therein lies the, the importance of context once again. So I, I have a, a problem with uh, one of my knees. I have a, 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 a tear in the meniscus, uh, that flares up whenever I eat glucose. And for, the, for three and a half years, I've been ketogenic and only once did I, uh, lapse. I was, I was at a friend's wedding and I ate the dessert because I was just being sociable. And mm. the next day I could not sleep. For almost for 24 hours I tried to sleep and couldn't because the pain in my knee was so strong. And the problem was that I'd been used, before going ketogenic, I'd been used to that low noise all the time of this pain. All of a sudden for, for almost a year I had no pain and then all of a sudden one day I had all the pain come straight back again. So, wow. uh, so it was, it was remarkable by being knocked out of ketosis. All of a sudden I did feel the pain. Now my, my levels of ketones are very low. I don't chase ketones and my levels are about the same as Tim Noakes between 0.2 and 0.8 uh, millimoles per liter. Uh, unless I fast for like two or three days and do two or three hours worth of exercise, then I can get them above two millimoles so, uh, per litre. So, um, you know, I have very low levels of ketones anyway. It's remarkable how little you need to be able to, to block that uh, inflammatory pathway. But it certainly, I, I certainly noticed that. Um, that uh, I, yeah. I couldn't, you, you certainly notice if you can't sleep because of the pain in your knee, that's, that's, <laughs> uh, that's a, that's a wake up message. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite literally. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, that that actually reminds me of another, I guess, uh, controversy, but very interesting one that's been going around is what ketone level is qualifies you as being in ketosis. And mm. 
And is this an individual level for everyone? So are we judging it by simply a concentration in the blood or is this uh, as a function of the uh, desired effect that it's exerting? Um, do, you, do you have an opinion on this, uh, Gabor? Yeah, I, I completely feel uh, Richard's uh, problem. I mean, uh, you know, I, I've been dealing with an auto-inflammatory disease for for a few years. And uh, yeah, I can I can tell you I've never measured uh, my ketones, and uh, I can easily tell when my ketones drop for a longer period of time because then I have a I have a flare up in my lower back. So um, yeah, I'm sure. I, I'm also um, on this diet for for the therapy. Ah, okay, that's not a word in English for me. Um, so for um, <laughs> the th- yeah, therapeutic yeah, effect. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I, I don't care. I, I absolutely don't care about uh, my ketone numbers, uh, whether it's uh, one millimore or three or six or whatever. I don't care. I, I'm after the effects. Uh, exactly. 100% after the effects and not, not after numbers. I, yeah. I think more than zero is the only diagnostic <laughs> that's useful. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. We we should talk about the the threshold. Yeah, but a really interest, interesting thing. For example, uh, I've been on a on a uh, low carb, high fat diet for almost four years now. And uh, actually, we started almost the same time. I started in January 2014. I know Richard started uh, mm-hmm. around the same time, and um, and uh, my experience is that um, I can be very quickly back to ketosis even after eating something like a kilo that's two two point two and a half pounds of uh, watermelon for example that's mm. almost 100 grams of sugar but uh, you know that i eat it completely separated from from other meals so no fat uh, no protein together with uh, with the sugar and if i eat it in the afternoon for example i i don't eat anything else uh, after that during the summer and then uh, the morning, uh, next day in the morning, I feel uh, I have no back pain, and uh, and um, you know, you have that uh, kind of uh, clarity when you are in ketosis. You can um, after time, sure. you know uh, where you are. So um, I think uh, some people believe that uh, you have to completely avoid uh, these kind of uh, foods, and uh, yeah, I did. Uh, I I done mm-hmm. so for for years, and then uh, I tried, and then I experimented. And uh, finally, I believe that uh, I can be back uh, into ketosis in less than a day, even if I eat a uh, high sugar uh, fruit meal. Interesting. I think it took it took me about three days after that wedding to to really be making a lot of ketones. But maybe the first day afterwards, I felt uh, an, a, enough of the pain go away that I could sleep. Uh, but certainly, I, I could feel it in my knee. But three days three days later. Uh, I was uh, I was well on the way, but I, that was about a, that was a year into my keto um, journey. So uh, maybe I, I think maybe like Gabriel, I, I'm I'm I've been there for so long now. That that's how my body is adapted. That to my body is now the new normal. And maybe mm-hmm. I would take only a day. Maybe I should eat half a watermelon and see what it does. <laughs> Yeah, yeah but re- report maybe the, maybe the yeah. context is different if you eat a cake. I mean, uh, cake is usually full of mm. uh, wonderful butter, butter and uh, and uh, and whipping cream and these kind of things. And uh, maybe if yeah. you eat the sugar together with the cream, and you know my views about uh, diabetes uh, and insulin resistance being a fuel partitioning disease. So if you have to do you sure. have to do more partitioning, then then it's it's a bigger problem, and then then it it might take more mm. time to get back on track. Yeah, so uh, I have a question for you guys. Do you do you listen to the STEM Talk uh, podcast with Ken Ford? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I find that to be a, a fantastic podcast because they have a wide range of of scientists um, mm-hmm. coming onto it. And uh, so Ken Ford and his uh, co-host, I'm I'm forgetting her name now. I apologize. Um, a Don Don Carnegus, um, vegan. Yes. Yeah. Well, vegetarian, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. I think you're probably right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so it's really interesting because, so they, they're very into nutrition. They had, they had a lot of Mm. guests that come on and talk about nutrition. And, um, in, uh, Marty Kendall's uh, Facebook group, Optimizing Nutrition, there was a a thread that started, um, concerning uh, about the 
his definition of ketosis essentially was one of the aspects in the in the thread and he so ken's argument was that you know it's it's okay to define ketosis as a certain level of of uh, ketones in the blood and mm. he used the example of verta saying that they're getting excellent results in their patients from 0.5 to 0.1. And he says, you know, he raises the open-ended question, essentially, would it be better if they were at two millimoles on a regular basis? And yeah. he readily admits we, we don't know. And that we, we we're also lacking. Don't know if, we don't yeah. know if it would be better if they were at 0.2. <laughs> yeah. Either, really? Exactly. Because, you know, the, the vertus, the verta results have been wonderful. And it's, 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 it's superb to have a, a randomized controlled clinical trial that's actually tested this stuff because now we can point to this whenever anybody says the ketogenic diet is a fad um, i can say i'm type 2 diabetic and here is an instance where it's reverse type 2 diabetes so um yeah. you know that that's been wonderful to have that out there but yeah i it's 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 quite possible that if you put somebody on a ketogenic diet they're forced to make their own glucose and their levels like mine are between 0.2 and 0.8 that wouldn't meet uh professor uh, dr finney's uh definition of a, mm-hmm. of nutritional ketosis and yet my diabetes is certainly reversed. So, and Tim Noakes is certainly reversed. So, yeah. um, so it might be that more than zero is adequate. All you need it, to be uh, yeah. doing is making your own glucose. Yeah. It might simply be uh, a marker rather mm. uh, an, an indirect marker rather than a direct one. But w- what's interesting is that uh, the uh, brain uptake of ketones is linear essentially. Ah, yes. Um, yes. up to, you know, a 600 fold range. Um, yeah. So it's it's really interesting because I've I've spoken with uh, people such as Andrew Scarborough who has a fascinating a success story of of treating reversing essentially his his brain cancer, Absolutely. and and he's been very uh, diligent in in trying to correlate ketone levels with with his reduction in seizures and you know reversal of the mm. of the tumor and all sorts of other uh, symptoms. So once it, we're back to context, we we just can't escape it. And <laughs> yeah. and this is why when you know it's I understand why we tell people not to chase ketones because we're saying understand the principles of why you're 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 uh, using ketogenesis or not. And, uh, yeah, so a lot of open-ended questions. I thought I'd, I'd bring that up because once again, we've got ver- very smart people d- disagreeing about definitions. And yeah. I, I think that's progress, actually. That means we're asking the hard questions. I think so. I think, well, Ken Ford's been ketogenic since the seventies. So oh. <laughs> he's not a man without some experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that's, and, that's, that's well put. And apparently they're looking at uh, ketogenic diets for astronauts because uh, uh, they need to manufacture food on the journey out to Mars and, and until they can build uh, uh, the ability to grow food, they're going to have to make it in a lab. Uh, and one of the things they're looking at is, a, is a, a molecule called triacetin, which is a triglyceride of acetic acid, uh, which is apparently something you can make. Gabba would probably know more than, than uh, the, certainly would know more than I would about this, about industrial processes that could make acetic acid and turn it into triglycerides. But that uh, that they're looking at that as being a ketogenic substrate for astronauts um, flying to Mars, which is fascinating. Yes, I I'd, I'd read about that, and I think one of the reasons was that the the state of essentially the state the ketotic state was protective against radiation. Yes, um, yeah. having to do with the change in the redox state, how it uh, alters mm. NAD plus and NADH. And that gets back to what I've studied for my master's thesis in cancer cells. Um, I initially wanted to use the intracellular lactate to pyruvate ratio to uh, predict essentially the compartmental redox state of certain cancer cells because it changes sure. depending on the tissue and all of that. And yeah. we know that radiation induces DNA damages, but it, it's, it also uh, affects metabolism very, very mm-hmm. greatly. And so it, it was interesting to to look at the redox state in that question. So I think the the people going to to Mars one day will have to deal with higher amounts of radiation, wh- whatever they they figure out in the meantime. Yeah, they're going to have to stick their thumb on the scale towards more NADH, definitely. Yeah, se- seems like it. G- good luck to them. I won't be the first one. <laughs> no. <laughs> um. So. So we uh, we we're gonna have to talk about diabetes at some point. But before yeah. we do that, I think we should 
hit one of the the uh, the topics that will never die, which is the protein mm-hmm. question. And I know Gabor is <laughs> going to hate me for that because yeah. he's, he bored he's bored him to, to death by he, it. Yeah. yeah, he's bored to tears by by protein. I'm kind of bored <laughs> as well. I mean, there there is this yeah. there there is a range below which uh, an amount is inadequate, and above which kills people. And uh, wh- where those endpoints are is really where the where the argument is. Uh, my opinion is, as long as you're in between those endpoints and you're meeting your own personal goals, whether that be uh, 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 aerobic uh, aerobic fitness or or reversing diabetes or um, building muscles, hypertrophy, if you're meeting your goals, then all all power to you. But protein is the only macronutrient where too much will kill you. And we know that for a fact because and, – and Gabor actually sent me a, 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 an interesting study that indicated that when we eat more protein than we're actually using at the moment, uh, it's all deaminated. It's all – all of the nitrogens are pulled off and all of the carbon spines are left over as, as metabolic byproducts to be reused in, in processes. And that will displace some of the fat burning. It'll displace uh, – it'll some of it can be co- converted into glucose – uh, some of it can be converted to keto acids, and 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 uh, uh, but all of that ammonia, all of that nitrogen has to be dealt with because uh, a, a buildup of ammonia in the body is deadly, and uh, and we know we know that as we increase the amount of protein coming in, the amount of urea. This is how we get ammonia out of the body. We turn it into urea, and then we t- then we urinate it out. The amount of urea caps out; it saturates at a, at a certain point. Uh, so we know that uh, above roughly 3.31 grams per kilogram of lean mass, uh, at that above that point, uh, we saturate the amount of urea coming out through urine. So unless that nitrogen is somehow magically escaping the body through nitrogen fairies, then you know you, you're going to build up uh, you're going to build up urea, you're going to build up ammonia, and that could be you know. Uh, uh, a dangerous state, you know, rabbit starvation, uh, mal de caribou. These are these are these are real diseases that uh, that um, uh, have to do with over consuming protein. So, um, so there is, a, I guess, one of my concerns that I have. Obviously, I have a concern about exogenous ketones, uh, reputationally affected ketogenic diets. But the other concern that I have is extremely high levels of protein. Some people take it almost a, a vegan dogmatic. Viewpoint: They not only want to be able to have as much protein as as they can eat, but they want me to eat as much protein <laughs> as they eat. Right. And if I eat any less, they're going to get offended. And you right. know, I I I, uh, I I I intend to fight that because um, I find that what I, the amount of protein that I eat is adequate to maintain my lean mass. And beyond that, I have no uses for protein. I don't use protein for energy if I can get if I can possibly get away with it because there are much more efficient uses uh, much more efficient storage me- uh, mechanisms for energy uh, in fat and glucose. And I, don't, I choose not to use glucose because I'm unable to deal with high glucose, and so that leaves me just one micronutrient to get my energy from. Yeah, so I've, I've written about this in, uh, in the past, and I, I've used uh, a few references. I think um, there's one reference which, which Tim Noakes used um, when he was on Sigma Nutrition Radio uh, podcast, mm. Where it's estimated that 35 to 40 percent of calories, which is about 200 to 300 grams of protein per day, so that's right. calcu- calculated on uh, a diet around 2,000 and a bit uh, amount of calories, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So we're talking, you know, the context is is uh, weight maintenance essentially, not hypo or hypercaloric, sure. and that seems about right to me, given. When we look at the functional uh, hepatic nitrogen clearance capacity or the urea nitrogen synthesis rates that we're able to do. Sure. And we can simply look at other species like, you know, lions or wolves, which can, which have a higher capacity of this. Their, their livers are more adept at dealing with these, with this, uh, nitrogen, essentially. Yeah. So when people say you don't have to worry about protein, I, I think what they, they, they're, they're missing is that this often happens when you're at a much lower calorie intake because you're attempting to, to lose body fat or reduce body weight. Mm-hmm. And thus the proportion of protein goes up. Yet right. the total amounts actually don't. Because yeah, why would you? You're going hyper, hypocaloric anyways. Yeah. As, as long as you're, as long as you're hypocaloric and adequately supplementing from body fat. So you, 
you know, mm-hmm. isocaloric because you've got um, fat bombs on your belly. But if for yeah. any reason you can't access those, for example, you're accessing more energy than your body fat is able to deliver, or, or you're, you're requesting more energy than your body fat is able to deliver, given the context of you know, in, insulin inhibiting lipolysis and all of these other factors that could, could, could come into play, um, uh, if you're uh, then not only uh, eating a lot of protein and hypochloric and unable to access body fat, now we're talking about get, turning all of it into energy. Uh, it's all being uh, deaminated because um, uh, those nitrogens need to be need to be um, uh, cleared, and now we have a now we have a problem because um, uh, the person is now hypochloric, and so. And so um, uh, potentially they could be uh, uh, leveraging their, their own lean tissue as well to supplement and now we're talking about um, uh, larger amounts of protein. We're talking about going over a limit beyond which um, we accumulate or we accrete uh, ammonia. And, and you can dip in and out of these states. Um, and a lot, You see a lot of these studies that test whey protein isolates. Um, they will uh, put people on the diet, on the high protein arm of the diet for two months and then put them on a low protein diet for four months and call it a crossover. In fact, they do it twice. They do it two months high protein, four months low protein, two months high protein, four months low protein, call it a crossover randomized trial. Um, but what they're doing is they're washing out that, that, that ammonia accretion. So, so you know, if, if, if for a short amount of time you can do it, um, but, you know, if you do these things for a long time, uh, eventually your inability to clear it fast enough has, has got to come into play, I, I would think, but, you know, I'm not a yeah. physician, so. No, I think that's right. It gets us back to the concept, you know, uh, or, or gets us to the concept of dynamic equilibrium. You mm. go above and below, above and below. So what happens on a per meal basis shouldn't be conflated with what happens over a year, say, of a sure. weight-stable maintenance diet in terms of protein intake. So, so Gabor, let me ask you this. So a lot of the advice that's given on the, uh, on the uh, Facebook groups is that, okay, you're having a weight loss stall. You're, you're doing, you're, you're already ketogenic. Um, you sh- you're just eating too much fat. That's essentially 99% of the advice that's given. So you should just up your protein. And in doing so, it will reduce your ca- calorie intake because of proteins, higher satiation and satiety effects. And hence, this is how you will lose body fat. Do you think this is this logic is correct? Do you think it's supported? How would you deal with someone asking you that question? I think it has some merit, I would say. So, uh, yeah, there is the thermic effect of uh, protein. So you just waste uh, some energy. Um, well, I actually say that it's kind of a biohack. And uh, to up to a certain level, it can... Uh, support your your weight loss goals but uh, at the same time i don't think that weight loss is a is a lifetime goal so uh, and uh, neither maintaining an extremely low uh, body fat body fat level uh, can be a lifetime goal i think at least to me it sounds stupid so that uh, i i have to have a six percent body fat and for this reason i i eat uh, three grams of uh, protein and and i throw out the egg yolks and and i know and they take uh, huge amounts of uh, whey protein isolates and, and these kind of uh, things mm. just just for this goal i see th- i don't think it's uh, healthy and, and i don't think it's a meaningful uh, life long goal but uh, for short-term biohacking, um, I would say you can try it. It's uh, it's not detrimental to to increase. For example, if if you are at uh, one gram of uh, of uh, protein per per uh, kilogram of uh, lean weight, uh, you can increase it even by fifty uh, percent or or even double it up to two grams, and it yeah. won't hurt. And, uh, but there are other, other biohacks. Actually, there are some similar biohacks uh, available. So you can supplement. I'm not a supplement guy again, but uh, you can increase then uh, coconut oil or MCT or C8 or whatever because uh, medium chain uh, triglycerides, they behave the same. They have a energy cost when processing in the liver. And, uh, they have the same, uh, effect of, uh, improving, uh, the, the, improving the preserving, uh, lean mass and, and, uh, losing some of the energy, uh, on the way to, to achieve these goals. Uh, I think, yeah, 
you can you can increase uh, protein to some meaningful levels you can increase uh, mct and and uh, you can go out and uh, take some cold exposure and, and, and these kind of biohacks i think uh, these all work but these shouldn't be long term at least not definitely not uh, lifelong goals yeah i think we can agree that caloric deficit always or almost always will will be adequate in in reducing your body weight um, not necessarily all from body fat, uh, and certainly not something that's sustainable. Uh, just about every study that has isochlorically, um, oh, has, has hypochlorically um, uh, uh, put, uh, had, had subjects that were hypochloric, just about every single one of those, their, their resting metabolic rate drops because access to energy drops because they're having less energy coming in. So their body responds, the, the homeostasis in their body responds by reducing the amount of energy. So the whole um, idea of using fat as a lever to be able to determine uh, whether you gain or lose weight is just a restatement of the calories in, calories out hypothesis. Um, right. And, you know, it, it really, it, it's, it is literally the same thing. And as far as the thermic effect of, of food when it comes to protein, a lot of people say, well, you know, protein, if you look at the Atwater factors, fat is nine kilocalories per gram and uh, protein and glucose are both four kilocalories per gram and then you have a 30% haircut that uh, the protein has for urogenesis um, uh, so that protein has like three gra- uh, kilocalories per gram. But, but in point of fact, if you put protein, uh, if you put the average protein in a bomb calorimeter, it produces 5.6 kilocalories per gram. So the thermic effect brings it down to four, you know. So, right. uh, so I think there's, there, there's certainly a lot of myths involved. I think some of it has to do with the fact that people just want to eat protein, and they mm-hmm. want their um, they want their um, decision to eat protein supported by the rest of the community also eating more protein. And uh, you know, it, it really comes down to, as Gabble said at the beginning, context. You know, uh, what is the context of your goals and uh, and uh, there are there's certainly a range within which you can play, um, and uh, and decide for yourself which of those um, ranges is going to help you. Yeah, that's um, yeah. It's a, it's a very interesting question for me because I'm I'm more interested uh, to see what people resort to as a first uh, as the first solution that they offer. Mm. Um, I. It's, it's like you said, it, it has merit. Uh, people should experiment with it. I think it's safe. We've got mm-hmm. a pretty uh, large range within which you can increase your, your protein intake. Yeah. And if it's high quality protein, uh, the range with which you can decrease it is actually pretty substantial as well. Mm. Um, at least for maintenance, maybe not for, you know, op- optimal, uh, for, for optimizing it or for, you know, maintaining libido or other subjective, you know, uh, uh, effects. But I think that people might be a bit quick to suggest that rather than saying, well, how are you sleeping? Right. Um, <laughs> because we know the effect that sleep has on insulin sensitivity. Um, yeah. I think it was Dr. Bickman who, sh- who shared a study recently showing that there was uh, close to 19% uh, decrease in overall uh, peripheral insulin sensitivity in people who had, I think it was a night or two of poor sleep defined by lacking a few hours. I mean, that is Absolutely. massive. Absolutely. Yeah, that's massive. So, and that's one of my biggest problems. I mean, sleep is circadian uh, circadian rhythms, as Gabor knows. My circadian rhythms are shot to hell. <laughs> you know, I'm I for for almost twenty years, I survived on four and a half hours of sleep a night, and that was by competitive advantage over other programmers. Is was that I was able to be functional at that amount of sleep and got three and a half extra hours of uh, programming every day. Uh, so, you know that 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 probably that was may well have been one of the major causes to me becoming insulin resistant in the first place. So um, I try wow. very hard now to sleep to satiety. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I say the goal in life should be to wake up without an alarm. <laughs> yeah, <you> can. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you manage to do that, Gabor, or is that just a, a dream uh, for now? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, holiday season. So, uh, yeah, seven, seven eight hours uh, these days. Quite nice. Nice. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so I would like to, to talk about a, a very low calorie diet in rodents shown to reverse, uh, type two diabetes. And this is once again from, uh, 
one of the, the favorite groups that we that we follow that uh, Gabor introduced me to about more than a year ago now the uh, uh, is by um, Rachel Perry and her right. her colleagues. I think this they're part of the Schulman Lab, yep. right, Gabor? If I'm if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And the title of the paper is Mechanisms by which a very low calorie diet reverses hyperglycemia in a rat model of type 2 diabetes. So I'll just very briefly go through the, the design and mention the results. And then I'll let you guys jump in on it and explain, you know, why it matters, what we can extrapolate to, to humans and, and not. So essentially they took, uh, sp- sprog dolly rats, which are, which are used mainly because they're very sort of do- docile and easy to handle. They don't have, you know, particular, uh, uh, transgenic, uh, um, fiddling with them, let's say. Um, so there are two groups of rats. They're made, uh, hy- hyperglycemic by stre- uh, streptozycin. Um, so it essentially messes with their ability to control their glucose. And they were put on a, a high fat diet, uh, for three weeks, uh, allowed to eat ad libitum. So that's about 59% fat, 26% carbs, 15% protein. So pretty, pretty standard, you know, not, not a diet that, uh, you, you'd be happy to eat as a human. Mm-hmm. And the other group, um, was, uh, on the similar diet, uh, and was then calorie restricted for three days. Um, um, and there's a, essentially they're looking at the effect of calorie restriction and trying to disentangle dietary effects from calorie restriction effects. And, and what they saw essentially, the, the results that they saw. So they looked at the liver and they measured triglycerides and, uh, what a diase or glycerol. So diglycerides. Mm-hmm. So instead of having three, uh, um, uh, uh, uh this three pronged, uh, uh, fatty molecule, you have one with two, the, the dye. Yeah. And what they see is a decrease in, PKCE activation that and it, which improved hepatic insulin sensitivity and the significance of that is because PKCE is when it's chronically activated and uncontrolled it can it associates with severe diseases like uh, tumors and diabetes so they found that the the calorie restriction group really re, uh, sh- got a benefit from reduced PKC activation. Mm. The other result they found was that there were reduced rates of net hepatic glycogenolysis. So the breakdown of the stored, uh, starch, essentially stored sugar, um, in the, in the liver. And the third result was that the reductions in, uh, liver acetyl CoA. So what essentially, uh, fat, uh, becomes, shall, shall we say to simplify in, in, in the liver when it stems from the uh, adipose tissue. Mm-hmm. This decreased rates of, uh, gluconeogenesis, uh, in the liver and also a decreased, uh, hepatic, um, activation of pyruvate carboxylase. And the significance of reduced pyruvate carboxylase, for those who are not familiar with it, it's an enzyme catalyzing the physiologically irreversible carboxylation of pyruvate to oxaloacetate, which is, you know, part of the process of how we create sugar in, uh, in our livers, or at least the end point of that process. And um, this correlates well, of course, uh, if we look at acetyl-CoA levels, we know that acetyl-CoA allosterically activates pyruvate carboxylase. So they, like all, like they always do, they very diligently look at every chain in the, every link in the chain of events leading to, to a mechanism they're exploring. So, I'll, uh, you guys jump in at any moment and tell me what does this study tell us about the quality of the diet or the importance of the quality of a diet versus the restriction in calories. And because this is, you know, in a, a, uh, in a rat model, um, should, uh, what can we extrapolate to humans and what can't we? I think we've seen, uh, caloric restriction in humans, um, increase insulin sensitivity. Um, Kevin Hall's uh, Biggest Loser follow-up, six-year follow-up, um, immediately during the weight loss process, uh, when they, they were calorically restricting and they were ex- inc- doubled their, their, their exercise rates, um, their, 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 their rates of their HOMA IR scores dropped significantly. Um, but then six years afterwards, their, their metabolic rates also dropped. And then six years afterwards, uh, the six years of that much lower metabolic rate Increasing their exercise or keeping their exercise at that higher level uh, for six years, uh, they all put the weight back on again. They all became more insulin resistant. So they were, in fact, they they didn't put all of the weight on, but their HOMA IR score 
IR scores and their fasting insulin was 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 much higher than they started out with. So I think for for, for we've seen certainly we've seen in humans a caloric restriction um, has a short definite definite short term effect. Uh, the difficult thing here is being able to sustain that to be able to and, and not have the uh, the metabolic haircut um, that then causes all of the downstream effects and, and uh, with people putting on the weight again and becoming more insulin resistant and, and more sick. And I, I suspect that uh, for humans, at least for for um, uh, for me <laughs> as a human, uh, I, I can be hypercaloric on a, on a high fat diet and uh, survive and without too much of a metabolic uh, haircut. Uh, if I do the same thing on a high uh, high carbohydrate diet, um, then I, then my metabolic rate drops, and that's what um, David Ludwig uh, was found in his studies. That the people who uh, had the, the least metabolic slowdown from caloric restriction uh, were the ones who were on the high fat arm of that uh, of his study. But as far as this particular study goes, um, it's a little bit beyond my uh, my uh, pay grade <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to to comment on it. Uh, Gabor, I mean, what have you got, mate? Yeah, before you go on, Gabor, I just want to correct something. They were actually uh, put on two diets. So there's the high fat diet I mentioned, and then a usual chow diet that was uh, much lower in fat. Um, it was 24% protein, iron protein, 58% carbohydrate, and 18% uh, fat. So sorry if that caused any confusion, yeah. guys. Go, go so, ahead, Gabor. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, I s feel there is some need for disclaimers here. Uh, first, my own disclaimer. Uh, you know, I, I'm kind of a believer of a um, of a um, mechanism of uh, developing diabetes and insulin resistance, starting from the gut, going to the adipose tissues, and then spreading uh, to all other parts of the body, all other insulin sensitive uh, tissues. And uh, this group actually. They have contributed a huge amount to our understanding of, of uh, these mechanisms. And this is a kind of a purely mechanistic study, but uh, you need to understand that uh, these guys are a little bit, uh, yeah, they have some interest in developing a um, compound uh, which can address, uh, which can attack uh, diabetes uh, in the liver. So uh, they, did some studies in the past and and uh, they have some if i'm not mistaken some patents pending uh for for some compounds that can address or attack diabetes in the liver specifically this is some kind of a pkc uh, e um, uh, addressing uh, molecules or modulating uh, molecules so I, I take this study with a little bit of a uh, pinch of salt in this case, even even this group is my favorite, uh, I had the feeling that they, they wanted to prove that uh, this, this can be done uh, at the level of at the level of the liver. And I think uh, yeah, they have uh, definitely proven uh, this point. Uh, would I do this the same way? Definitely not. So that's uh, not uh, I, I would start in the gut, gut as, as usual. So um, I, I would try to achieve a, a healthier adipose tissue via a intervention which uh, addresses gut uh, functionality. But uh, from from the very basics, from the mechanistic view, I think this is really an interesting study, so that it, it improves our understanding uh, what happens uh, in the liver when your insulin sensitivity improves. So. Uh, uh, mechanistically, this is a beautiful study, uh, as usual. This is the case with this group. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, if if we should jump into some compounds that address some uh, processes in the liver, or we should f tweak our diets uh, based on the diets used in the study, and uh, and uh, focusing on on uh, hypocaloric diets, just by I, I like to say based on a lawnmower uh, effect of caloric uh, reduction, I, I, I don't think so. So uh, I'm, I may be a little bit uh, biased towards uh, more gut and, and uh, adipose tissue point of uh, view. 
and uh, I think I tend to believe that uh, the liver is kind of uh, um, how, how should I say it's uh, the soldier, yeah, not the general, yeah, something like that. So it's uh, <laughs> it's a downstream effect. It, it I think at, at least usually the the problem doesn't start in the liver. So, but but if you can if you can use a targeted method which addresses the problem downstream, and of course you absolutely need uh, a problematic liver, an insulin resistant liver for for diabetes, and uh, probably you need a fat deposition in your pancreas so that your your beta cell function uh, drops, as Roy Taylor's group uh, showed. Uh, yeah, if if you yeah. can develop something which uh, specifically addresses these downstream effectors, then most likely you you can achieve uh, great results. But I would like uh, my approach is to to address the root cause of the problem where it starts, and I, I think it starts with uh, with lifestyle lifestyle problems, mostly diet, then also circadian rhythm, and and so on and so forth. So. If you can uh, get closer to the root cause, you 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 manage you can manage to improve uh, the whole system and not only the the last parts where where it is it's broken. Hey guys, apologies for the quick interruption, but let me remind you that this podcast is brought to you by HealthIQ.com, the fastest growing life insurance agency in the United States. I learned about them a few weeks ago and was immediately intrigued. Customers who qualify for their services by taking a health quiz like their cycling IQ or running IQ quiz, can get lower rates. Why? Because health-conscious people like CrossFitters or people following a paleo diet have a lower risk of heart disease, diabetes, and other conditions stemming from metabolic syndrome, something we talk about a lot on this show. So to see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com slash BDN or mention the promo code BDN when you talk to a Health IQ agent. All right, let's get back to it. Some of these, uh, yeah. some of these effects are gestational uh, lifestyle decisions as well. The the the, the glucose that uh, uh, glucose will pass the placental barrier and insulin will not. And so, a mother who is uh, is choosing a lifestyle with a, a large amount of glucose may be able to to adequately cater to, uh, f- for that with her own production maternal her own maternal production of insulin. Her fetus has to become very good at making insulin very early in life, and so these are down. These are certainly life. It's certainly lifestyle modulated, um, but these are a, a child comes out of the womb with a pancreas that's very good at making insulin and is able to make a large amount, um, and has learned that from a very early age. And so this is something that that uh, stay. You often see this with. Uh, with uh, children whose siblings um, are, are quite insulin sensitive, and one sibling is insulin resistant, and when you look into what the the mother ate during the during the pregnancy, if there if there are decent records, you'll often find that um, that that was a, she she was eating a, a very high carbohydrate diet, unusually so for for, for one of her pregnancies, and so. Um, and it's so that's interesting because it's not obvious to me whether this this adaptation is advantageous. Um, because if you're, if you are, um, if your pancreas can make more insulin because your, your mother was consuming a lot of, um, high, not necessarily just high glucose, but, uh, foods which, uh, let her have a lot of circulating glucose in her plasma. Yeah. Uh, we should say. Sure. Um, is that an ad- advantage or are you just sort of giving them the tools to continue Enabling that that excessive uh, concentration of glucose in the blood, I, I'm honestly not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure either. I suspect that being able to overproduce insulin, having a pancreas that's able to produce a prodigious amount of insulin, is not a good thing. I think having a pancreas that mm. that produces a normal amount of insulin uh, and has uh, that experience and has adapted to expecting a normal amount of glucose and a normal normal amount of insulin. Those two children, I suspect, will have a different uh, future. I, I think you could say yeah. when I when I was born, um, if you had the ability to look forward in time, you could probably predict that that child, uh, that Richard at zero years of age, thirty eight years of exposure to the lifestyle that he 
that he would eventually choose would make him diabetic. Whether you can say at that point that that child is that rich, young Richard, zero years old Richard, is diabetic or not is another question. I think the I think the same argument has been made certainly by people that say that somebody who treats their diabetes with a ketogenic diet is still under un, underlyingly is still diabetic uh, because as soon as they change their diet, they, their, their their glucose will. Will, will go into high ranges. Um, I think I, I suspect that uh, that that argument um, uh, really uh, uh, we're in. A, I'm personally and most people who are insulin resistant have deranged ourselves so so much that we're no longer part of the normal um, the normal um, range of human variability. <laughs> so so uh, right. you know we, we've been thoroughly deranged by by our environmental factors that um, that now. Um, we're not going to be able to come, become non-diabetic no matter what we do, and and, and so my, my thesis, I guess, there really with the, the fact that insulin can't pass the maternal uh, the, the placental barrier. And my thesis there really is that uh, we can actually be growing type two diabetics in the womb. Mm-hmm. Uh, so to to get back to the the study that launched us into this part of the discussion, there there are three. Points I, I'd like to, to bring up. Um, and then you, you, you know, attack each one that you, you want first. So the first is that they found that the insulin sensitizing effect of this short term, so three days, uh, of, uh, calorie restriction, which for a rat is quite a long time. Uh, actually, this insulin insulin sensitizing effect of the calorie restriction is confined to the liver. They didn't see, uh, you know, uh, overall insulin sensitivity or peripheral insulin sensitivity improve. That's the first point. Second of all is that, um, so I'll just quote from the paper directly because it, it says it quite clearly. To determine whether the effects of a very low calorie diet to ameliorate hyperglycemia and the high fat fed type 2 diabetic rats, whether it depends on the diet that's administered, we fed the rats a quote fast food Western diet. And that's mm-hmm. described as a safflower oil based high fat diet supplemented with 5% uh, sugar water. So sucrose in water which gives about, you know, half calories from carbs, about 40% from fat and 10% from proteins, which was estimated based on their uh, daily intake of water and food. And they noticed that, uh, no, this was, this had, was not diet related, which might, might surprise quite a few of us. Um, and what's more is that three days of caloric restriction did not change body weights in these rats. But it did change their fasting plasma glucose and insulin concentrations, liver glycogen, uh, uh, triglycerides, diglycerides, and the ratio of the PKCE or PKC epsilon uh, enzyme we, we discussed. So I, I threw out quite a lot there. So I don't know if you caught it, but the Didn't... three days of caloric restriction did not change body weight in these rats. Yeah, yeah that's, what could, that's what I could, I, I heard. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, rats can lose up to 20% of their body weight in 48 hours of caloric restriction. So was it just mild caloric restriction? Um, I'd have to check the methods more specifically, but it seems that to have such great changes in all the other factors they did, yeah, how can the body be. weight not change? Yeah. Um, I, 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 first time I read that, I thought I'd, I'd made a mistake when we were preparing before the podcast, and I, I kept checking and... No, that's not the case. Both groups, if you look at the, so I put the, uh, the graphs, the people can see that in the show notes. The body weight, you know, is, uh, just about, about 415 grams, it seems. Uh, same between both, uh, both groups. So I'm not sure what happened there, right? Yeah, uh, I, will, I wouldn't say it's possible. the same, but it's, it's not probably what they say. When they say same means that it's not, that the, the, the change is not statistically significant. Sure. So yeah, it's, it's mm-hmm. not the same, but uh, it's it's a small change, it's not not significant. But uh, right. but uh, talking about yeah, I mean, if you you can you can do that. I mean, uh, if we did a podcast on uh, bariatric surgery, and mm. in three four days, uh, the weight change is not statistically significant. There is a weight change because they, basically they are they are they are fasting. Yeah. Uh, for 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 three four days, so there is a weight change but uh, the importance is in in the signaling what mm. this uh, fasting or caloric restriction causes so you have a you have a huge change in signaling and uh, maybe all the weight is uh, 
going out from from the liver and being used uh, at other places in the body. So there is no change yet because all the fuel is just being mob- mobilized from from your liver, your yeah. your your fatty liver. So and then other uh, tissues uh, just uh, start start consuming, and that's uh, where you see the big uh, drop, for example, in uh, triglycerides. Sure. Uh, you, you see the drop because uh, the tissues just start, start uh, utilizing all, all the fat which has been uh, circulating all around in, in this futile cycling, elevated mm. levels, but uh, low utilization. Yeah, and um, so we're sort of implying that if they had a more precise measurements, like a metabolic chamber for the rats, We'd, we'd be able to more accurately pinpoint changes in, in body weight or expired CO2, for example, or, or heat differences, which might account for why with a severe, uh, cause it's a very low calorie diet, right? It's in the name of the, the diet they gave the rats. Sure. So I don't have the figures under me, but I'm assuming it's substantial, definitely statistically substantial. So we, it's once again, we're, we're confronted with this, with incredible homeostatic response to, decrease calories and like we said three days in a rat is massive yeah and to to not see this difference between groups will anger many <laughs> people on the in the uh, more chicoist uh, camp as, mm. as we might say yeah so i just found that very interesting they put that in the paper without you know without batting an eyelid yeah they're just very happy to leave it there yeah, rats can lose an, an amazing amount of weight in a very short amount of time so it's 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 remarkable mm. I, th- I think i think if you're faster rat yeah, they'll lose twenty percent of their body weight in forty eight hours. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's remarkable. Absolutely. And um, so the other point that that I brought up was that they essentially, according to them, disentangled the effects and 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 said, no, this is doesn't have to do with the quality of the diet in this case. What we're seeing is a result of calorie restriction that's happening through multiple pathways or mechanisms, mm. but this is not due to the quality of the diet. Now, I'm very skeptical of that. Um, I don't know what 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 do you guys say about that? I mean, uh, I've never refused the idea that uh, severe caloric restriction can uh, improve uh, mm-hmm. metabolic metabolic parameters like like this. So yeah, why why not? I see uh, nothing revolutionary uh, except for the uh, the the certain mechanisms uh, disentangled. So they just show how it works. Uh, this type, this type of uh, restrictive uh, diet, it's it's fine with me. I mean, what is what is really that surprises you, Rafi? What what surprises me is um, so this all reminds me of a a, a series of posts that uh, Petro from Hyperlipid did, uh, I think about a year or two back, when we we're looking at the specific effects of linoleic acid on the adipocytes. Uh, and again, this was mostly um, uh, rat studies and mice studies, if I'm not mistaken. And essentially, that the kind of fat ingested, and this is where it gets complicated extrapolating from rats to humans, because we don't have the same relationship to the quality of fats, mm-hmm. that this could change the level of the adipocytes uh, insulin sensitivity and have downstream consequences on how that adipocyte handles, you know, lipolysis. So it could be that they're essentially right because there was not enough of a difference between the the different diets in terms of the fat composition. It could be simply that I'm wrong about that, that it really doesn't have to do with the diet quality, that the caloric restriction effect size is so big as to overshadow any dietary quality effects. But I'm not sure. I'm I'm more confident about uh, what they said about their own results, which is what they're talking about, to be fair. I'm very skeptical that that translates to humans. I think I, I think actually that guess is, th- yeah. this is this is very similar to to the study uh, done by Roy Taylor's group. So they use an 800 mm-hmm. calorie uh, diet for humans for right, right. something like uh, eight weeks, and mm-hmm. then they see uh, very similar improvements in in glycemia and so on and so forth. Uh, if you have a look at uh, fig- figure one, uh, what is the biggest difference you you spot? So what is the most significant change? You can you can easily tell um, it from the, the number of insulin number of stars or liver triglyceride. Yeah. Liver triglyceride. Yeah, <laughs> the, the liver fat. And what is the the biggest uh, single biggest uh, uh, effect? What Roy Taylor's group uh, pinpoint out yeah. calories. 
It's uh, the the fat in the pancreas. Ectopic fat. Yeah, they, uh, yes. they, they, so, they use a yeah. ultra high resolution MRI and and yeah, yeah. Um, and, 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 that was uh, where they came from. Yeah. Yes, and and if you if you uh, if you if if I may go back to my uh, wide ideas of how diabetes mm-hmm. uh, develops and starts in the gut, goes to the adipose tissue, adipose tissue dysfunction, fat goes to the liver and to the muscle and to the pancreas, and what happens when you when you reverse this uh, this process? I mean, you start removing the ectopic fat, and uh, I mm-hmm. think it's not necessary to see a huge change in body weight during the first days or first uh, weeks to be able to see a, a big improvement in, in signaling, basically. Right. If, you, if you start losing the fat from the right place, for example, from the liver and from the pancreas, which was not measured here, uh, the, the signaling improves very substanti- substantially. So I, I don't really see um, a huge discrepancy between this study and, and uh, the previous ones. It just uh, just gives us uh, a snapshot into the mechanisms, how the liver and uh, the getting rid of the liver fat specifically improves. Okay, yeah, that's that's a, a good point, and it reminds me of the of the discussion thread we've uh, we we uh, jumped in on with uh, Lucas Tafour, who talked about the role of caloric deficits also as a signaling as a signal, yeah, um, which is not so signals not only mediated by the type of let's say the the type of molecule that we're uh, or the relevant molecule where that's where that we're discussing, but also simply. About caloric abundance itself is a signaling uh, effect, AMPK and I think that's maybe what we're seeing here. Yeah, AMPK yeah. is a signal, yeah. Absolutely right. So it's sensing the ATP uh, AMP mm. ratio. Sure. And uh, and you have that, and this you know feeds into how mTOR is gonna gonna respond and all of that. So yeah, yeah I think that's probably what we're seeing with the Taylor study and, and this one. And uh, it's just always impressive when mm. you you see the or or. You think you see the laws of physics <laughs> being uh, <laughs> violated when, in fact, they're not. We're just yeah. not always quick to to imagine how how else we could explain it. I think yeah. so. Uh, I, that's, I, that's a really nice uh, result. Yeah, I think one of the uh, one of the things that we have a problem with, uh, speaking from my previous expertise as a mathematician, <laughs> one of one of the uh, things we have a problem with understanding about calories in, calories out is that. Uh, the amount of energy that we use is 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 um, uh, predicated by the amount of energy that's available, and so it, it becomes uh, what's called a chaotic function uh, in mathematic terms. It's a function that's iterative that 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 works upon itself, and so it's very difficult with the traditional calories in calories out model. Assuming you know, I have uh, assuming I have a a a, a, a an energic system, uh, 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 an animal that, that's, that's considered an energic system, and I give it so many calories, um, and it uses so many calories, then by definition the difference is going to be stored or um, it's going to be its deficit. What actually ends up happening is that uh, the amount of calories that it uses changes um, underneath the system based on how many calories are coming in, and so it becomes a chaotic system that's unpredictable, and so... That's one of the problems a lot of people have is that, you know, in these overfeeding studies, uh, when we overfeed humans, I mean, they, 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 they start using a prodigious amount of energy in these futile cycles. That, uh, um, and it, it, when we underfeed them, all of a sudden they become very sparing of energy and, uh, and the metabolic rates plummet um, significantly. And so um, it, it, it's almost the calories in, calories out model is almost it's too simple to, to describe right. what's happening. Yeah, and and you, you, so you bring up a very interesting point. I would like you to to say more about that because I think people uh, have a, a real hard time understanding what the laws of thermodynamics tell tell us and don't tell us about how our our body uses this energy. And maybe you can also go back to uh, Atwater's measurements of the energy contained in food and how we might be mismeasuring them when we count fiber the same way as we do fat or protein. Right. So, so um, I think that, um, uh, well, the, so I'll start with the Atwater factors. We know of those as being 4, 4, 9, uh, 4 for carbohydrate, uh, 4 for, uh, for protein, and 9 for, for fats. If you actually look at a molecule of glucose or two py- pyruvates, which is the, that, that's the, the, that's the, 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 the fuel that's being delivered into the system. Um, 
the, or say a, a molecule of palmitate, which is a, a sample fatty acid, uh, or you know a sample protein like alanine, the pyruvates and the alanines are, are very spread out um, uh, molecules, and palmitate is compressed. It's it's just this long chain of carbons with with hydrogens very tightly tightly basically hydrogen legs. It looks like a centipede, and uh, when you understand that the 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 TCA cycle is basically turning these substrates into energy. When you understand that what it's really doing is it's getting energy out of those hydrogen bonds. So the more hydrogens you have in the molecule to start off with, and it's also pulling carbons apart. But uh, but but the 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 primary job is to 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 pull all these hydrogens off. Palmitate, uh, uh, you know, a a a, um, a fatty acid is much more dense in hydrogen bonds than than either uh, a carbohydrate or, or or protein. So so that's where it all really comes from. The 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 the, the thermic effect of food, as I mentioned before, with regards to uh, glucose. I mean, there is a, there is a thermic effect of there, there is an energy cost in processing glucose. It's very small compared to the energy cost in processing uh, proteins. Um, uh, but you know, you 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 you're going to use uh, two NA, NAD pluses to to, and you're going to use I think it's six ATPs to be able to get glucose split into pyruvate and then and turn it into acetyl CoA and then stuffed into the TCA cycle. Got to sp- spend money to make money, sort exactly. of uh, a yeah. notion. Yeah, and so, so whereas, whereas fatty acids, um, they're, they're, they're basically nitrate. <laughs> they're, they're, they're very highly, de- they're a very dense form of energy. And so, um, uh, they are, uh, they're going to produce more energy from, from the same, same weight. Uh, but down to the proteins, proteins have got, proteins aren't just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They're also nitrogen, sulfur, and selenium. Um, these are, the, they need to be deaminated. They need to have all of these nitrogens removed as, uh, as ammonia molecules. And then that's going to, each of those is going to take off two of your, uh, three of your hydrogen bonds. Every time you remove a nitrogen atom, you're going to remove three hydrogen bonds and that's taking away some of your energy. And so that reduces the amount of energy, uh, available in protein. Um, so, so, uh, so, and the other question you asked me, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's just to explain to people the, the limitations. Essentially, it was getting to the point of how limited we are in calculating caloric oh, right. intakes and using, yeah. you know, uh, calorie calculators because yeah. there's the, you know, error when you, if you look on the a food label, that it can be, I think the last time I looked was close to 20%, so plus 10 minus 10 error. So yes. that's massive uh, yeah. difference. Yeah. Um, then there's Gary Taubes' famous example of saying that, you know, over a, something like a 20 year period, if you have one extra bite of food every day that amounts to, let's say, 20 calories, then over, you know, so many decades, that's uh, equal to this ridiculous, absurd amount of, of extra body weight or body yeah. fat. We, yeah, we can't there, really, yeah, we can't really, uh, we can't really know how much energy we're taking into, to, as you say, because labeling laws allow mm-hmm. a twenty percent variation. Manufacturers will have a, a significant variance in in how much energy is in the food product that they produce. Mm-hmm. Um, they may go through lean cycles where um, they, where their their inputs are, have got slightly less energy, and they and, and they may the food may taste exactly the same, but may have slightly less energy. Um, they probably won't reformulate their labeling. They won't retest their products. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of reasons why we really can't know how much energy is in these is is in these foods. Um, the other thing is that, that the, the amount of energy that we use during the day goes up or down based on how much energy is available to the body. This is all part of the homeostasis. We're actually talking about trying... I guess it's a little bit like we think of, of, of our body as flying a plane where we push the joystick forward uh, by eating more calories and we and uh, uh, eating fewer calories and doing more exercise and that takes the plane lower and then we pull the... The the, uh, the joystick back by uh, by and the plane goes up. The pulling the joystick back, of course, is eating more food and doing less exercise. But but that's really not what's happening. We're actually in a plane that's on autopilot, and the plane is mm-hmm. it's a homeostasis. And the way that we change the plane is that we 
change the autopilot's um, uh, settings, uh, which 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 compass heading that the autopilot is heading towards, uh, or what altitude we want the autopilot to be to be flying at, and uh, then the autopilot will respond. And if, for example, there's a wind shear and the wind takes the plane off the heading, the autopilot will correct and bring the plane back to its original heading. And so, um, so I, th- I think this homeostasis produces this chaotic function that uh, that results in um, a- when we add more energy, we assume that we're g- that means we're going to be storing more energy. And in fact, when we add more energy into the system, uh, the body decides, well, I can do all these extra functions. I can not only warm up the blood more, uh, which is going to uh, improve the rate of uh, immune function, I can produce more immune cells. I can produce... Uh, I can I can add extra uh, 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 protein to bones. Uh, I can I can grow hair faster. I can do all of these little processes that the body chooses. The body's homeostasis chooses to either budget in uh, uh, to spend some energy on, uh, or leaves out of the budget in order to save a little bit of energy. And all of these all of these um, uh, things happen below the level of our consciousness. So the actual Amount of people talk about exercise and about how um, you know if you if you're putting on weight then just do a little bit more exercise. The amount of energy that we that we use by running on a treadmill for half an hour is like you know 150 200 cal- kilocalories. Yeah. And it, it feels like a ton. It's nothing. Yeah, and the amount of energy that we that we go through a day is like 3,000 kilocalories. So you know it, it's it's a fra- it's a tiny fraction of the of the amount. Yeah. Um, and likewise, the amount of uh, the amount of uh, 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 food that we that, we, that we're taking, in, as I said before, and as you made the point, the labelling laws don't allow us to have a have a good prediction of how much energy is in this food. We really have to trust our homeostasis, and we really have to attempt to bend the needles of our autopilot to be able to uh, go up or down, and uh, depending on our uh, individual um, uh, goals. And you know, in my in my case. My goal is actually not about losing weight. It never has been. My goal was glycostasis, and I achieved that in the first three months. And it, from from there on, it's been continuing glycostasis. If I produce ketones, if I lose some weight, if I manage to maintain muscle mass, those are all good things, but they're not primary outcomes. But you know, for somebody whose mm-hmm. primary outcome is, uh, is having an 8% body fat, then sure, you probably have to calorically restrict, and you can probably only do it for about three or four months before... Uh, your metabolic rate has been uh, has been kneecapped so badly <laughs> that you're going to put it all back on again, <laughs> you know. And when it comes back, yeah. it's going to be more fat than lean tissue. So, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. but, uh, yeah. Um, the the point you bring up reminds me of of something I often hear saying. Oh well, you know, low carb diets or any diet works because you have this simple rule, and it just happens to be. It happens to, to result in this negative energy balance. Mm. Okay. This is what we often hear. All diets work because of that. Mm-hmm. And this, first of all, this has to be true by definition if you're losing weight. Absolutely. So that's not helpful. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the other thing is, is that I think people are actually, we could use that same logic saying that's what you're doing with caloric restriction. Mm. I could say, well, okay, you're calorie restricting, but you're changing all these other qualitative biologically relevant variables such as the proportion of macronutrients that 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 you're in intaking so maybe that's what's actually making the change right and it's funny how people only see one one side of that lot of that uh, logic and um so i I think we should be very careful about being very confident about why diets work or or (laughs) don't um yeah so i'm i'm you know i respect the laws of thermodynamics obviously i have no choice no and no, beyond no, that, I'll, I'll just say, wow. <laughs> none of us do, but we have we have lots of ways of using energy that 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 don't involve living, um, and you know our bodies can choose how much energy they're going to budget during the day, and you know it's a matter of uh, trying to affect that homeostasis. Um, is 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 my opinion, uh, and I could be wrong mm-hmm. about all of that. Um, and maybe maybe going back to university to study this stuff, I'll find out I was wrong about everything. <laughs> Progress. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, yeah, using my favorite uh, example, uh, body temperature is also under a homeostatic uh, regulation. <laughs> Good point, yeah. So it's it's thermodynamics, isn't it? Because it's mm. energy. Uh, heat is energy. So uh, the the basic uh, problem is when you, when you face, a, you contract an infection, for example, 
what you need to do. You have a uh, too low dissipation of heat, mm -hmm. and then you have a uh, too high production of heat. So that's <laughs> obviously the, the root cause of uh, fever. Obviously. So what you need to do, immerse yourself in a tub of cold water and uh, eat ice cream. <laughs> yes, there you go. So problem solved. <laughs> Yeah, that's how you yeah. get rid of a fever. <laughs> exactly. Obviously. <laughs> so just yeah, just a uh, cup of cold water and some ice cream, guys. That's how you deal with fever. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think uh, I think it's yeah, a simplistic uh, yeah. way of looking at it. And and, and I, w as human beings, we tend to gravitate towards simple answers um, because generally, a simple the simplest the simplest answer is generally the right the right answer. But that is a that is a uh, trope that that you know that can get us into trouble. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's certainly true. By the way, do uh, these guys account for mm -hmm. the temperature of uh, ice cream when they consume it? Because uh, it's uh, it's a difference in energy. So if you that's drink if, if you drink <laughs> hot if you drink hot chocolate with the same amount of calories than ice cream, mm -hmm. then yes, how comes? That's a very yeah. good, well, that's a very good point. <laughs> Now we've joined the science denying club, so that's it. We're full fledged members now. No, you just have to account for the difference. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll be I'll be curious to see the next uh, Kevin Hall study um, because uh, if if I recall correctly, the the parameters were, which were that they chose to see if there would be a metabolic advantage or not was set to around 300 uh, calories, 350 calories. Sure. And what they found was an effect around 150. Mm -hmm. So it was deemed statistically significant, but not biologically significant. Right. Which, which to me is a very funny instance where usually it's the opposite, you know, mm -hmm. the other way around. We say, well, yes, there is a difference, but, you know, it probably doesn't matter. And here I'm of the bias or the opinion that, wow, there's a 150 calorie difference. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really significant, actually. So I don't understand why people are, are saying there is no metabolic advantage, which, by the way, I had predicted there wouldn't be. Mm. So I was wrong yeah. about that. And it was very interesting to see that, wow, they actually found a difference, yeah. measurable difference in humans. To Gary, to Gary Tab's point, you extrapolate that 150 uh, uh, kilocalories of difference over a year, mm -hmm. and we're talking about significant weight yeah. loss. <laughs> Right. But actually, right. And uh, that was calorie controlled. Yeah, mainstream dogma has it that uh, obesity develops over a long time by a caloric surplus of something like uh, seven, eight kilocalories per day. Seven or eight. Right. Yeah. <gasps> wow. I, I read a mainstream. Uh, I think it was a book chapter from an obesity uh, yeah. book, and it said uh, one of the biggest guys in obesity research. Uh, obesity de develops as the result of uh, seven, eight kilocalories uh, surplus over a long period of time. Over a yeah, long I period think, of time. So I think that was Ke Kelly Brownell, wasn't it? I don't know, but uh, comparing to the comments, yeah. comparing to the 150 mm -hmm. per day, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. enormous difference. Right. Yeah, uh, that's a that's a good point, actually. Um, so we've been going for about an hour forty, guys, and I, I could go on all day. <laughs> But I would like to ask you, um, actually, I would like to ask the question back to you, Richard, that sure. you'd asked me uh, a few days ago. And, and I'll have the opportunity to, to talk about it with uh, Dr. Feynman. Yeah. Um, we were, so we were, so you, you mentioned that, um, you took statins, mm -hmm. uh, a few years back. So maybe you want to tell us, you know, why, why you took them and, and all of that and how it uh, happened with the doctor. But essentially the question you raised was about, is there an effect of statins on ketones? Can it lower the production of ketones, increase it? Does it get through the, to the, um, through into the mitochondria by transport or diffusion? Sure. And I was just wondering if you could, you know, restate your question and maybe you could have a, yeah. A well, try. I, I've got to admit that, uh, as you know, Carl and I did Keto Fest and it was all user funded. It was all kick started and, uh, Carl got a second mortgage to be able to have this thing. And, you know, so we, we, we really, we swung for the fences with Keto Fest. And the absolute highlight of my time was getting a lecture by Professor Feynman on the TCA cycle on the main stage while doing a podcast recording with him. Uh, so oh, it was a personal yeah. lecture into the TCA cycle, which was outstanding. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I asked him this question and I don't think he, he was prepared for 
it was it would have been a long conversation and and he was being harried from one person to the next and I think it was a bit unfair mm-hmm. to sort of sneak this question up on him but um, my uh, so in my history was that uh, uh, was that I, I became pre-diabetic at 38 and I went on the Atkins the Atkins diet and became um, I managed to stay pre-diabetic and not turn, and not tip over the, the edge into diabetes. Um, and that, this was in 2004. In 2011, uh, my HbA1c was 5.9. So I was just starting, you know, I was in that pre-diabetic range. My triglycerides were 71 and my HDL was 45. So not not a bad ratio. I mean, I certainly mm-hmm. had low trigs, but but my, uh, my LDL just went over the edge of the uh, precipice. It basically, that it went, it, it passed the threshold beyond which that they prescribe statins. So I started a mm-hmm. statin in April of 2011, and my uh, LDL, as I say, was 2000, uh, 208 uh, milligrams per deciliter. I'm using US terms because um, sure. some of, some of I, was, I was living in America for some of the time, and so um, I just uh, tend to stay with that. So um, by, so that was in April of 2011, went on statins. Uh, by December of 2012, my LDL had dropped from two, 208 to 119. So as advertised, the mm-hmm. statin was doing its job. Uh, my LDL was dropping. But my HbA1c went from 5.9 to 6.3. And my trigs, mm-hmm. my triglycerides went from 71 to 146. So my <coughs> triglycerides doubled. Oof. And my HDL oh. went from 45 to 42. So a small drop in HDL, probably insignificant. So that that was in just that was in uh, about a year and a half, uh, April twenty eleven to December of twenty twelve. So by April of twenty thirteen, so we're talking about a, another six seven months. My LDL had dropped. My my LDL was about the same. It had gone from one hundred nineteen to one hundred twenty seven. This was under the effect of the statin therapy. Uh, my HbA one C had gone from six point three and started at five point nine. Remember, it's now at six point eight, and my triglycerides. Was still double, and my HDL was starting to drop. My HDL had dropped to 37. So uh, then, fast forward to May 2014, uh, my LDL had finally dropped to 92. So the statin therapy had been a wonderful success, outstanding success. But now my HbA1c was 7.5. My triglycerides were 233. They started out at 71 before I took this statin. And my HDL had dropped to 29. So, and I've actually got pictures on my blog. I'll, I'll give you the link uh, to, to put mm-hmm. in the show notes. But you can actually see my body, my body becoming diabetic. And uh, at that point, I went uh, ketogenic, and uh, I stayed on the statin. And at that time, it, this was like the first six months of being ketogenic. Uh, my, uh, I stayed on the statin. My LDL stayed down, but my 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 glucose my glucose dropped to 5.5. 5.5, and then a couple of months after that, mm-hmm. it was 5.2, and it's been there for, for three plus years. My triglycerides dropped. My triglycerides went from 233 uh, on a ketogenic diet to 137. So, so, so this is so you're actually seeing the diabetes being reversed actively in my body. Yeah. But this, I still have the statin. So the LDL is a it's 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 a, it's a the LDL is still being managed by the statin therapy. So. After six months of being ketogenic, I then went off the statin because I'd been t- saying to my doctor the whole time, I want to go off the statin, I want to go off the statin. And finally, and, and I'm one of these people who always follows my doctor's um, prescriptions, but uh, I argue with him every time and I bring in science to, to, to state my case. So I'm probably the most annoying patient he's got. But um, Oh, I might beat you for that. I'm not sure. <laughs> so, so anyway, I finally, I finally went off the, the – uh, off the statin and my, my LDL went from, it got down to 77. My LDL went back up to pretty much where it started, 204. But all of the other things were still good from the ketogenic diet. So, mm-hmm. and the interesting thing that happened around about this point was that my ketones in the first six, seven months while I was on the statin were quite high. When I went off the statin, my ketones dropped to my now normal low uh, ketone levels, as I mentioned, between 0.2 and 0.8. So, Almost not nutritionally keto- ketotic, as according to, to Finney and Volek. Mm-hmm. So, so my 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 hypothesis uh, was the following: that uh, actually, one second, I'll just bring up this. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so my hypothesis was that uh, I was looking at 
uh, the uh, the metabolism, a, a, a model of the metabolism, and I was looking at how human beings make uh, uh, um, cholesterol, and and the process whereby statins inhibit the production of cholesterol. So what we do is we we uh, we 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 push acetyl CoA into the into the TCA cycle, and if for any reason we don't we we can't immediately turn them into citrate, uh, we we uh, spill them out, and that normally makes ketones, but it also makes cholesterol. And so uh, inside the mitochondria, this process makes ketones. In the cytosol, which is the the, the cell outside the mitochondria, this process makes uh, it's it's called the mevalonate pathway, and it makes cholesterol, it makes uh, heme, it makes vitamin K, it makes uh, CoQ10, a whole bunch of important things. But the the one that we seem to be fixated upon is cholesterol. So so this this um, uh, the the particular point where the, uh, the where the statin affects uh, this process is. The, it, there's, there's an enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase. HMG-CoA is one of the molecules in the pathway from uh, acet- uh, acetoacetyl-CoA turning to HMG-CoA, turning to mevalonate, and then into all of these uh, byproducts, including cholesterol. So uh, what the statin does is it inhibits the enzyme that converts HMG-CoA into mevalonate. And, it's um, the rate limiting enzyme of that pathway. Yes, exactly. So, so that's why statins are very effective at, at reducing the amount of cholesterol that a human makes. Um, so the question mm-hmm. really, my, my question really is, um, this is, this, the same pathway inside the mitochondria makes ketones. So HMG CoA is turned into acetoacetate, uh, which we then convert enzymatically into beta hydroxybutyrate. So, um, so, uh, I guess my question is, does a statin affect the rate of ketogenesis. And my personal experience was that my rate of ketogenesis was higher when I was on a statin than, than it was mm-hmm. when, I, when I went off a statin. And I don't, I don't think this is a reason to take statins or to get off them. Or I, I, It's just mm-hmm. a curiosity. Um, and the question really, I guess, was that uh, was um, does HMG-CoA uh, diffuse across the, uh, the mitochondrial barrier or does it have a, an active transporter to be able to to go from uh, from uh, once once so so I guess the question is if if we have statins that, is, that are inhibiting the production of cholesterol inside inside the cytosol does that mean there's a buildup of HMG CoA because the enzyme is being that that rate limiting enzyme is being uh, inhibited so does that buildup then result in somehow that HMG CoA getting back into the mitochondria can it diffuse back through or can it is, is there an act, active transporter through uh, that causes an increase in production of ketones and that's uh, that's I guess right. that, that 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 it, it's a it's and, and now I, I I sprung this on Professor Feynman as he was walking through a, <laughs> a crowd of, 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 of uh, biochem students lecturing them yeah. so uh, it was a bit unfair well if anyone can that. answer it, it's it's him. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so, I, I'd love to hear. Yeah, that. No. I'd love, love to hear the answer to that. But so that, yeah. that that's my poser. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, I'll just say something quickly, Gabor. Uh, b- before, if there's anything you want to say about that, my first thought is that statins. The the big trials looking at statins, and we all know how how no- notorious those trials are in terms of design and hidden data. Yeah. But there's it's pretty reproducible that people don't seem to fare the the end points of metabolism or the indirect markers of metabolic function don't fare particularly well on statins. Right. And I'd be surprised if we couldn't somehow link um, a mechanism whereby statins do something very naughty to mitochondria. Right. Um, so I think it's a, it's a very good question, actually. And I'll, I'll be very interested to see what Dr. Feynman has to say. Mm. And, uh, so what do you, what do you think of this, Gabor? What, what springs to mind? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's well known that, uh, taking statins increases your risk of, uh, developing diabetes quite substanti- yeah. substantially. Sometimes they say 30, sometimes, sometimes 40%. I think it's wow. even higher. Mm. Relative risk, we're talking. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, uh, most Could likely be. there is something to do with mitochondria. If you have a disease, yeah. a metabolic disease, then it, it has something to do with mitochondria. Yeah. But I don't know the it's, mechanisms. Uh, I haven't looked into this at all. 
I, I, I don't really care about statins. I, I don't want to, uh, <laughs> I don't want to be involved in, in stat, with in statin therapy in any ways. Yeah. So. Yeah, you, you're, you're fighting your battles on the adipose, adipose front. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm taking care of my gut and, and I don't care about statins. Yeah. I, I was uh, prescribed a statin when I was about 20 years old. Wow. Um, uh, I never took it because um, it's just about because I had noticed my HbA1c was climbing up, not because I had any particular symptoms, simply because that's when I started to become interested in in science again and and you know how health and biology and all that uh, came into play. And uh, because my cholesterol was so high after starting a probably not even ketogenic, just a low carb diet back then, I was in in Holland, and the doctor saw my lab uh, lab results and t- and tested me for FH. Mm. Found that I was, uh, I was not, I didn't have familial hypercholesterolemia, still wanted to prescribe the statin. Mm. And I said, no, thank you. Yeah, why not? So, yeah, hey, just another patient who's willing to pay for it, right? Yeah. 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 So, uh, well, I wish well, I hadn't was, had was, statins, yeah. but I wish I hadn't had statins. Uh, and I can look back at the photographic, uh, progress and, uh, it's fairly scary. Uh, what happened to me? I mean, you can see me. I I I I went from probably about, um, I guess, um, a hundred and one hundred and fifteen kilos to one hundred and fifty kilos in that in that time. It was fairly scary. Yeah, right. Right, right when you went on the statins, and you were still on the Atkins while while uh, taking so, it. So I I one of the problems that I had. I did Atkins back in 2004 when I was first uh, diagnosed, yeah. and uh, I managed to stay on that for about two years fairly hardcore, uh, mm-hmm. but I ended up getting a lot of nausea, um, and uh, part of that uh, had to do with the fact I was eating a high-protein version of Atkins, so I, was, uh, uh, I, I wasn't quite eating lean proteins, although I did eat a lot of chicken uh uh, chicken breast, so that that is a lean protein. But um, I was uh, I was r- very high on the protein end of things, and and the most stable low carbohydrate diet for me, the one that I seem to be able to stay on the the longest, is at the lower end of the protein spectrum. And so, um, mm-hmm. so uh, so that 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 has worked for me. I certainly had almost I I have a little bit of nausea when I wake up in the morning, uh, which um, uh, which tends to prevent me from eating breakfast often. Um, but for the most part, um, I, 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 I've had almost no nausea on a, a, a ketogenic form of, of the diet. So, mm. so to cut a long story short, I, I, I was low-ish carb. I wasn't quite on Atkins uh, when all of this happened. Um, and I was putting on the weight. I, as soon as I, uh, my, my HbA1c went over uh, into the pre-diabetic and then the diabetic range, I went on the diet that I was prescribed by the Australian Diabetes Association, which is 300 grams of carbohydrates a day. I mean, this is a hypocaloric, high-carbohydrate diet, lots of whole wheat, lots of whole grains, um, lots of fruit, um, uh, some starches, and, you know, it's a lot of obviously whole grains, but also starchy vegetables, very little fat, almost no fat, and uh, not a lot of protein. And, uh, you know, but 300 grams of carbs a, a day, I did that for almost a year in that process. So that certainly made me worse, but I was just doing what I was mm-hmm. told to do uh, by the diabetes educators. Um, it wasn't until I went ketogenic. I should have known because I'd been on Atkins and Atkins had worked for me in the past to, mm-hmm. to, to keep me in a pre-diabetes state. Um, I had certainly um, – uh, I should have known better. I, I really should have. And I regret – if I'd known, if I'd known when I, in my twenties what I know now, I never would have gotten diabetic. Right? Mm. No, definitely not. <laughs> yeah. No, I think we. Can, I mean, you know, we. Uh, there are many people who have that thought. I think, and uh, <laughs> let, let's let's hope that listening to us today, it'll it'll give them some some motivation to to make those changes if they haven't already. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Hopefully, that message will will get out. Well, guys, I want to thank you for for taking the time. This was a real treat for me. I think we went on a very nice nerd safari. Um, <laughs> we should we should do this again any any time. Um, and uh, uh, Richard, thank thanks so much for, for coming thanks, on guys. the podcast. You were better than great for your first uh, podcast oh, appearance. I tried hard. I didn't uh, I didn't do well. Yeah. Do so well on the mouse study because I didn't have a lot of lot to contribute to that. But uh, you guys are more than welcome oh, yeah. on uh, the two keto dudes. 
uh, we would love to have both of you on and uh, we've been trying to get Gabber on for two years so <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll, I'll have to kick him onto your podcast at some point <laughs> yeah with uh, it was great so thanks Gabor as well um, I don't know about you guys but I have another podcast to prepare with Dr. Feynman so I'm, I'm in for another treat yeah and um, and then this <laughs> evening I'll be speaking to Nick Mailer, uh, oh. uh, uh, Bucky Dog on, on Twitter. Yeah. So we're going to try to deconstruct some logical fallacies in the world of nutrition and, and see where that takes us. Yeah, Nick Mailer is awesome. We're actually having doing a podcast with him on Sunday. So uh, give him Perfect. my best. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, will do. Okay, well, uh, everyone, thank you for, for listening. This was uh, tons of fun. So please um, share the episode, go on, on uh, iTunes, review it, rate it, continue the discussion on the Break Nutrition Facebook page, the Two Keto Dudes Forum, hit us up on the social media, and uh, stay tuned. We'll be back very Bye. soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.